Ladies and gentlemen, warmly welcome to Think Forest webinar. Thank you for joining us. Our topic today is public perception on forests and bioeconomy. We are going to hear top scientists, policymakers, journalists, and other key stakeholders. The Think Forest webinar is facilitated by European Forest Institute EFI. My name is Virpi Haavisto, and it's my great pleasure to be your host today. Uh, the aim of the webinar is to discuss and also to understand how people see forests, forestry and forest-based bioeconomy. We will hear four keynotes, one panel discussion and a launch of the newest uh, EFI study. And of course, we do have time for comments and questions from the audience and from the media. Before we go to the Okay, and uh, the secondly, uh, we use the, the chat box, so please feel free to write your comments and questions to the chat. And if you want to address your question to a specific speaker, please write the speaker's name with, together with your, with your question. And also, you can see the program and the, um, the presentations of the, of the speakers in the web page there down the video. And last but not least, uh, we use Think Forest hashtag, so please feel free to use that. At this point, I wish you a very, very good webinar. Please enjoy the excellent speakers and the excellent discussions. Now it is time to, to present uh, Janet Bodocznik, who is the Think Forest president. Uh, he is also co-chair of the International Resource Panel hosted by the United Nations Environment Program. He is chairman of the Forum for the Na Future of Agriculture and the Rural Investment for a Sustainable Europe Rice Foundation. He is also a member of the European Policy Centre's Advisory Council. Please welcome Janet Potocznik. Thank you, Virpi. Can you just indicate me that you hear me well, please? Yes, Th yes, we Thank hear. You. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to our webinar, link to the launch of the new FE study, Public Perceptions of Forestry and the Forest-Based Bioeconomy in the European Union. An interesting theme, uh, not discussed very frequently. The event is very much focused on how media science and uh, stakeholders group shape the political and general public perception of forests. Uh, like everywhere, the importance of media should not be underestimated, like everywhere, we should be aware that according to the opinion pool, scientists are those who are most trusted among public. And like everywhere, the acceptance and lobbying of various interests related stakeholders groups, it's extremely important for public opinion and in particular policies created. Discussing those issues in the context of forest, forestry and forest related bioeconomy is thus obviously an important topic. EFI study is providing us with an excellent background for the debate. Looking to the results of the study, I will of course not comment them before the presentation is actually done, and I will rather do that in my closing remarks. I can just say that for me, they were not surprisingly different from what I was expecting based on my common knowledge and experiences acquired from the public policy related life. But before, I would like to draw your attention to another report uh, released also just a few days ago by Club of Roma and Systemic, a system change compass implementing European Green Deal in time of recovery. 
I was very much involved in its preparation. Why? Because the report is based on natural resource optics. Uh, natural resources and environmental things are the core limiting factors of human well-being and of our economic development. The way we treat natural resources, to a large extent, determines economic results as well as environmental and health impacts. Natural resources are the bridge between economy and competitiveness on one hand, and climate change, biodiversity loss, pollution and health implications on the other. In the first part, the report identifies the necessary enabling conditions addressing the main drivers and pressures that would need to be addressed and redefined. They are presented like compass in a circle from redefining prosperity, natural resource use, progress, matrix and competitiveness to redefining incentives, consumption, finance, governance and leadership. For each of those 10 areas, three core system level policy orientations are proposed, which deserve special attention. Any policy decision would need to be stress tested through the proposed optics, not detailed and prescriptive, but rather showing the direction to follow so that the compass could work. In the second part, we have moved from this abstract, but still very real policy making environment to the markets and to the human needs. System based and Societal needs logic are leading to an alternative structure which differs from economic areas and sectors conventionally used to structure the economy. We have identified eight economic ecosystems. They are functioning in safe operating space, following the logic of nature and respect the planetary boundaries. Economic ecosystems are designed to deliver specific resource intensive societal needs, four of them, healthy food, built environment, intermodal mobility and consumer goods, or support fulfillment of these multiple societal needs. Also four of them, nature-based solutions, energy, circular materials and digitalization, digitalization, actually innovation. Why we call them economic ecosystems? Because they are interlinked like ecosystems in nature and because a lot of solutions providing resource related human needs from our economic activity could be mirrored and based on experiences acquired from nature. For each economic ecosystem, we provide also specific economic ecosystem level orientations. Finally, 50 plus nascent concrete economic development opportunities are proposed. Each of the economic ecosystems champion a number of subsystems, a non exhaustive list of economic opportunities consistent with compass orientations and alternative structure of the economy based on economic ecosystems. They would become, they could become new lighthouses of the green, resilient, fair post COVID economy. Actually the 21st century backbone of competitive European economy. Ecosystem of nature based solutions are about bioeconomy and include restoration of degraded land and coast, smart forest management, urban greening, systems for paid ecosystem services, seaweed potential, marine and land-based environmental protection areas, and ecotourism. Few of the mentioned, few of the mentioned subsystems are linked to economic opportunities emerging from uh, sustainable forest management. I do believe the logic and compass proposed could well be serving also in the forestry and bioeconomy approach and would certainly deserve also your attention. A complex system connecting our macroeconomic policy related world with very microeconomic concrete economic ecosystem development opportunities, rare but possible and also needed. European Green Deal was a brave call and decision to act, a promise and also a commitment but it is no longer enough to just act. We must do so quickly, systematically and together. Compass is trying to contribute to European Green Deal implementation by providing a guidance for the direction to achieve exactly that and the role of forests and bioeconomy should be considered seriously. Since we are today discussing public perceptions of forestry and the forest based bioeconomy, one thing is truly surprising. The relatively low attention forest, forestry and bioeconomy are receiving, in particular 
from the side of policymakers concerning the fact that they are covering about 42% of the European Union's total land area and taking also into account how important role they play for our sustainable future. Let us learn from the experts who prepared the EFI report, as well as from those being responsible for policy creation, communication, media, science, and public campaigning. How do they see and evaluate the public perceptions and forest-related policy? How do they explain the trends the study is showing? And where do they see the solutions? I wish you a fruitful webinar. I will join you again at the end and try to draw some conclusions. Back to you, VRP. Thank you, Janic, for your wise words. We will begin with two great keynotes on how to combine different needs for forests in policy. The keynote speakers will be Terhi Lehtonen and Maria Patek. Terhi Lehtonen is State Secretary of the Environment in Finland. Maria Patek is Director General for Forestry and Sustainability in the Austrian Federal Ministry of Agriculture regions and tourism. First, we'll, I welcome Terhi Lehtonen on stage. Please welcome Terhi Lehtonen. Thank you, dear organizers. Thank you very much for the invitation to join this important conversation. And thank you also to Janis Potocnik for his thoughtful words and engagement. I have to share a personal memory. I was personally very impressed by uh, uh, your dedication and commitment to biodiversity and your skill in getting the agreement in Nagoya in 2010 on the IT protocol, well, IT biodiversity targets and on the access and benefit sharing protocol. Ladies and gentlemen, forests provide important ecosystem services to society, such as clean air and water, carbon sequestration, soil protection from erosion, providing habitats for animals and plants, and resilience to disasters and to climate change. They are highly significant considering the urgent need to combat and adapt to climate change and safeguarding biodiversity. Beyond such ecosystem services, health benefits and recreation are increasingly important, the value of which we have especially appreciated now during the COVID-19 pandemic. Visitor numbers in Finland's national parks have grown 20% compared to previous year's numbers. In some parks, uh, the use has multiplied by two and a half times. In Finland, every person has a right to access to all forests. That means that everybody, also foreign visitors, are free to walk, ski, ride a horse and um, stay and camp overnight at any forest and pick berries and mushrooms without a permit from the landowner. Uh, an average Finn lives only 700 meters from the closest forest, I'm told. Forests are also important to the Finnish economy as a resource base for our forest industry and as a source of income to farmers and other forest owners. Biodiversity in forest, however, is in decline. Forests are the most important habitats of endangered species in Finland. The role of old fo growth forest, old trees, and in particular the amount of deadwood is of key importance to biodiversity. The biggest cause of biodiversity, forest biodiversity decline is human and economic use of forest. Forestry and the draining of peatlands has also significant eutrophication impacts on Finnish lakes. As you well know, um, biodiversity loss is a global phenomenon. The IPBS has reported that in many habitats, the loss of species is at a level that risks collapse of the whole ecosystems. Finland is committed to halting biodiversity loss at home and at international level. My government has increased significantly budgetary resources for protecting nature and restoration of degraded habitat, habitats. Still, it is clear that in the big picture, it is not sufficient to rely on protected sites for halting biodiversity loss, but managed forests have a role uh, to play. Climate change is already having a negative impact on biodiversity in Finland, but forests also have an important role globally and nationally in sequestering carbon. 
A shrinking carbon sink in forests means that the greenhouse gas emissions from fuel combustion are even lesser part absorbed in vegetation and more of it is heating the atmosphere. The climate neutrality targets of the Finnish government uh, by 2035 relies on the assumption that the land sector carbon sink is maintained and increased. Based on existing policies and harvest levels, the sink is projected to decline from average levels since 1990, and the government has committed to increasing the sink with policies and measures under the new land sector climate program by at least 3 million tonne of CO2 equivalent. Until now, the balancing of interest between economy and biodiversity and climate impacts in the management of forests have been largely government by, governed by guidance that is agreed in a participatory process with forest users and with input from forest research. Measures in support of biodiversity, such as the amount of dead wood left after harvest, are mainly driven by certification. 92% of the Finnish forests are PF, uh, PEFC certified, 10% FSD certified. Ladies and gentlemen, in my personal perception, until now, the forest management practice and the financial support to forest renewable have been dominated by economic interest and the aim of increasing harvest and mobilization of forest resources. This has started to change, and I believe we should accelerate the development. The government is working on the next generation of guidelines for financial support to forest management, which should remove the bias and support towards draining of peatlands for forestry. The government has also renewed its ownership policy towards the government-owned forest and has set sink targets as well as biodiversity goals. Since forest has so many roles as a source of wood-based products and non-timbered products, bioenergy, recreation and well-being, it is important to ensure that their benefits are utilized widely but also sustainably and the value of all ecosystem services are accounted for. Until now, forest owners have benefited economically only from harvest, not from the stewardship of biodiversity and the ecosystem services the forests provide. On the other hand, carbon offsetting schemes are developing as a potential source of revenue for maintaining and growing forest carbon sink. The question is, is if landowner can have a financial gain from increasing the carbon stock, should there be a penalty in its removal? Who actually owns the carbon capture by photosynthesis? Combining the different policy objectives, biodiversity protection and climate optimization with efficient economic use of forest resource is definitely possible. The public sector has a role through the financial support instruments and in ensuring that the legislative framework provides adequate safeguards. It is important that the, all the stakeholders take part and are consulted in the design of forest policy. Forest owners have an, naturally a decisive role, but all actors need to assume their responsibility. The forest sector's increasing demand for wood bears not only economic, but also social and ecological implication and the impact of our, uh, and impacts our climate commitments and obligation, uh, obligations under EU law. Bioeconomy has a great promise to replace fossil fuel-based materials, but it can only be a viable solution if the demand for bio-based materials is not accelerating declining carbon sink uh, and biodiversity or biodiversity. I'm convinced these challenges can be overcome. At the moment, for example, the ministers of the environment and agriculture and forestry are jointly chairing a series of roundtable discussions aimed at building stronger cooperation between actors and finding together new and open-minded ways to safeguard biodiversity in forest management practices. Some 30 organizations, including administration, science, industry, forest owners and environmental organizations, are participating in the process. Forests are Finland's greatest asset. We live off them, some in terms of income and job, be it through a forest industry or tourism, but we all crucially depend on their ecosystem services and the well-being they provide us. Thank you for inviting me to share my views on this important topic today. 
Thank you so much, Terhi, for your insightful full talk. Now I welcome Maria Patek on, on the stage. Please welcome Maria Patek. Hello, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Warm welcome to all of you from Vienna. These are in extraordinary times we are living. The current crisis has changed the way we live and the way we interact. As one of the advantages, I'm glad to be connected to all of you across Europe for this video conference. On the other hand, we face a lot of challenges also regarding forests and the forest based sector. In recent years, storms, snow pressure, and climate change induced bark beetle outbreaks are easy. In Austria, more than 60% of harvested timber was damaged timber last year. Therefore, the implementation of sustainable forest management is key for us. We want to ensure that multiple effects of forests may be sustained also in times of crisis. We are going to invest 350 million euro in sustainable forest management activities context of climate change in initiatives to foster enhanced use of timber and innovative wood products. We know sustainable forest management is the basis to ensure that multifunctional ecosystems services that forests can deliver. The sound forest legislation and its enforcement are safeguarding concept of sustainable forest management and the multifunctional services of our forests. This way we secure income and jobs, especially in rural areas. The further development of a successful bioeconomy across Europe is therefore very important. In order to answer the question how to combine different needs for forest in policy, to understand the main challenges we are currently facing. The main challenges for us are, firstly, the impact of climate change. Active management is needed for both sequestration and adaptation in order to retain the vital functions of forests. Secondly, economic competitiveness of forestry. The forest-based sector is a constant challenge. This economic challenge is even more pressing due to the impacts of the current pandemic. The third area of concern is the political fragmentation of forest-related policies at the international level. We need to enhance our joint efforts in order to secure coherence of policies, tracing various aspects of forestry forests. Fragmentation of forest-related policies is ongoing. It is more important than ever to reach out and coordinate between the forest sector and other sectors, the regional and the national level. Forestry is being touched upon by more and more different policies. The EU biodiversity strategy is certainly marking an important step within also in this report. Therefore, we do strongly advocate for a forest strategy beyond 2020, which builds upon the well-balanced existing forest strategy and addresses forests and forest-based sector, having in mind all three pillars of sustainability and involving the relevant stakeholders. Furthermore, subsidiarity and simplification should not only remain words, they need to be given great meaning should be put into practice. Moreover, the sustainable use of our regional renewable resource water it is of, it's of utmost importance for Austria as well as for Europe. Let me reiterate what Ursula von der Leyen said. State of the Union speech. She said, and I quote, we know that the construction sector can be turned from a carbon source into a carbon sink. If organic building 
periods like by Bright. To support this vision, we have just recently launched the Austrian Timber Initiative. I have been talking now a lot about the different challenges and its forest policy, but what we should always be in. And I am grateful that you chose this topic for today is the public perception on forests and the forest based sector. Whatever we do, communication is key. We know today that we need to enhance the understanding for a broader public for sustainable forest management and the use of the renewable resource water. This is why we communicate with our 90 different stakeholder organizations within the Austrian Forest Dialogue since more than 50 years now. Building trust and fruitful cooperation needs time and awareness of different interests. This spirit of cooperation I'm talking about needs to be cared for inside the sector, but also outside of the sector. That is why I'm glad this study on public perception will be presented to me. And I would like to highlight the involvement and excellent work of the Austrian Competence Center, UTK Plus, in this initiative. It is important to find the right answers on how to communicate more effectively and gain trust and acceptance. We want the society to understand that what we are doing in the best interest of our forests and therefore the well-being of each and everyone. It will be key to follow up on today's findings and investigate more how to communicate and collaborate with Having said this, I hope you are all doing well and that you stay in your best of health. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Maria Patek, for your wise and insightful words. Next, we will have two keynotes on science and media images of forests and their use. The moderator of the keynotes will be Lauri Hetemäki, and the keynote speakers will be Tom Heap and Christopher Raymond. Lauri Hetemäki is the assistant director at the European Forest Institute. He is responsible for managing the Institute's science policy work. He is also a uh, professor at the Faculty, Faculty of the Agriculture and Forestry at the University of Helsinki. Please welcome Lauri Hetemäki, Tom Heave and Christopher Raymond. Thank you, Jyrpi, and good morning, everyone. Can you hear me? Is it okay? Okay, thank you. So welcome everyone to this session in which we have two short keynotes on the science and media images of forest and their use. Before letting the speakers on the floor, I will give a short introduction to the topic and the session and the speakers. I start the introduction by quoting Jim Morrison, the rock singer from 1960s. He said, Whoever controls the media controls the mind. Today, the role of media is bigger than it has ever been. Media not only inform, but also shape public opinion. The media plays a especially big role in those issues which the public does not possess direct knowledge or experience. In our urbanized countries, this may be true, for example, on forest-related issues. Today, we have an honor and pleasure to have in this seminar a representative of media, the fourth estate, as often stated, in the form of Tom Heap. Tom is a journalist with 20 years' experience on science and environment reporting. He presents the PPC radio environment series costing the earth and the current affairs element of the popular PPPC TV program Country File. Before letting Tom to speak, I'm happy also to introduce our second perspective to the topic, uh, that is the science and the speaker there. 
Besides media, science is also key in shaping the public perceptions, at least in Europe. One very recent indication how science institutions may directly shape public perception is the Nature Journal's editorial this month that was titled Why Nature Supports Joe Biden for U.S. President. Uh, I think it is one uh, really direct uh, uh, example where science institution is directly trying to shape the public perception. I think the other extreme could be an approach that Richard Dawkins, the world famous evolutionary biologist and former professor for public understanding of science at the Oxford University took. According to Dawkins, science is interesting and if you don't agree, you can fuck off. However, however luckily it seems that a majority of EU citizens are interested in science. The Eurobarometer survey on public perceptions of science and research has shown that a large proportion of Europeans believe that uh, science is important in solving the challenges that we have ahead in the next 15 years. In addition, the science-based institutions have also shown that there are ways to organize and disseminate uh, science information in a way that respects science role as an honest broker, yet manages effectively to shape policymakers, media and public perceptions. I think this is evidence, for example, by the work of international science-based panel, such as Interco Intergovernmental Panel of Climate Change, IPCC, and the Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, IBES. Their reports get a lot of attention in media and also shape the political agenda and public perceptions. In summary, it's really important to discuss how science is shaping public perceptions, how the scientists value uh, the impact and what are the best ways of science to try to shape the perceptions. So I'm really happy that we have here with us Christopher Raymond to discuss science role in shaping public perception and how this might be related to scientist values. Christopher is also coordinating lead author of the IPES task force, which studies, among other things, scientist values on biodiversity and ecosystem services. Christopher's own research has focused on socio-cultural values of nature. Last year, Chris was recognized as highly cited researcher. Fewer than 0.1% of the third researchers have earned this exclusive distinction. Thus, by his own work, he is clearly also shaping the perception that scientists and probably also media and public have on uh, nature. I warmly welcome Tom Heap and Christopher Raymond to this session. We start by asking first Tom to reflect on the role of media shaping public perception on forest and their use. Tom, please take the floor. Thank you very much indeed, Larry, and, and thank you all for uh, inviting me to be part of this uh, conference. I'll get straight to it. I mean, it's kind of obvious in a way, but trees are universally loved. Pretty much the symbol of the tree of life is something powerful across the world. And whilst I must admit from the start that my analysis is going to be a little bit UK and European based, and there are some, I think, some African delegates on the to this conference as well. And I wouldn't assume to uh, make remarks about how uh, forests really are perceived in African culture. So this is a little bit of a Eurocentric view, but here we go anyway. Um, as I say, Forests are very, very well loved. You take something like the ash dieback breakout, the Chalara fraxinea, and it triggered a national emergency here in the UK in the, re in the response and a kind of outpouring of anguish and sadness across much of Europe. And when we think about going into woodlands, for many people, they are kind of the pinnacle of a natural experience, a sort of 3D surround sound and vision feeling of being actually immersed in nature. It's almost like swimming. It kind of envelops you on all sides. And this was very much, as we just heard, heightened during the COVID lockdowns. Lots of people talked about 
the importance of that. Visitor numbers increase, as we've just heard. People were watching kind of 4K webcams so they could feel like they were in the forest. And I work for a program, the television one in particular, Country File, that really celebrates that. We're always looking at the sort of dappled light and the strong trunks and talking about the mystery and the beauty and the natural importance of forests. And they do. They are seen to shelter and protect us from the ravages of modern life. And in a way, there's been a change here. If you go back hundreds of years, the image of the haunted wood was it was a perilous place. And it was kind of important in our psyche as a place of danger through fairy tales. But that's ev evaporated. There is still a narrative of peril, but in many ways the, the peril has flipped. In the past, when humans went into the forest, the story was it might be them that was in danger. In many ways, people now think it's the trees that could be in danger. This narrative of peril with trees is really, really strong in the media and with the public. And of course, our love for trees has only increased with the science of climate change becoming that much better known. Trees are rightly seen as our allies in the fight to hold uh, to hold um, a warming world. I, I read in France, for instance, it's estimated that trees absorb 10% of the country's emissions. In Ireland, it's 5 to 10%. Just about all the countries, as we've heard, including Finland, have plans to increase this sequestration of carbon. And trees, because they're loved, promote remarkable political unity. Even Donald Trump loves trees, getting behind a one billion tree planting campaign in the US and a one trillion pledge globally. It's true that it was a bit more words than action, but at least the words were supportive. And here in the, in the UK in the last election, I don't know if any of you saw this, we had an extraordinary competition between the political parties about who was going to promise the most trees. It was a day when People talked about little other than trees. Labour were promising 100 million uh, trees per year. The Greens, 70 million. The Lib Dems, 60 million. The Conservatives, 30 million. The Conservative Party logo is even a tree. That shows you how it gets through to people. Now, the Conservative Party were promising the least, and they were the ones that got elected. But I don't think it was the promise of fewer trees that cut through. As you're aware, there was quite a lot else going on in our election. There is, of course, a lively scientific debate about the actual speed and longevity of carbon sequestration in forests. And I've also met some of grassland and, as we just heard, peatland uh, enthusiasts who kind of slightly worry that the, the tree loving bandwagon can be a danger to some of the carbon stored in um, natural environments that are not forests. And of course, the public care hugely about forest and forest loss in other countries. Fires in Australia, California, Portugal, Siberia, and of course, Brazil make big news and people are very, very worried about them. And there have been huge campaigns surrounding this um, in uh, in France, particularly about palm oil. Uh, the WWF had done a survey that said 67% of consumers want the government to do more here to ensure that their shopping doesn't fund deforestation. So people really care. And this pressure is felt by companies too. I mean, just last month, some of our biggest companies, Unilever, McDonald's and things, lobbied the government not just to ban illegal forestation from products, but all deforestation, making the point that uh, local laws are often corrupt, so legal or illegal is often a slightly dubious uh, distinction. And also uh, carbon is emitted whether the deforestation is legal or not. And so the climate doesn't care whether it was illegal, it's still a hurt to the climate. But I thought interestingly, this thing about all, all deforestation, I think they were aiming it more at tropical rainforests, but I thought this could set a dangerous precedent for the legal forestry business. And trees are very totemic here. We have our own version of uh, the TGV high-speed rail, we have our, 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 our high-speed rail being planned here, and the most public objection you get is when ancient forests are disturbed and uh, iconic trees are felled. So where does all this leave productive forestry in this narrative? Well, I think it leaves it with a bit of a public relations headache, to be honest. Um, outside of Scandinavia and Canada, the narrative of conservation and protection is so strong 
that felling a tree, the chainsaw, one behind me there, is a go-to image for environmental destruction. People associate it as a bad thing. I'd say in the UK, people are simply unaware of productive forestry. They don't really have an image because they don't really encounter it very often. Uh, it's slightly more encountered in Scotland. And I'm aware, of course, that in Scandinavia, it's an important industrial sector. And the more cyclical nature of harvesting and planting is better understood. Not least, of course, because many people in Scandinavia actually have patches of wood themselves and practice this within their own domestic economy. And of course, more than half the land area of a country like Sweden is actually under productive forest. But just coming back to the UK, for instance, even our own forestry enterprise, Forestry England, its strapline is forests care for us, together we care for forests. So this kind of empathetic relationship is put in the shop window and the idea about harvesting and use of forest is a little bit pushed back um, it, and it's interesting because as i'm sure many delegates to uh, this conference know the forested area of europe is actually increasing but i would bet if you ask people across certainly Britain, but I think most of the rest of Europe, is the forested area of this continent increasing or decreasing? They'd all say, well, I think not all, a majority would say decreasing, because this narrative of peril is very strong. Whereas in the last 20 years, the actual wooded area of uh, Europe has gone up uh, by 16 million hectares. That's roughly twice the size of Ireland. So there is a growth in the area of forest. As we heard from Terry from uh, Finland there, growth doesn't necessarily mean quality. Biodiversity can still be lost even when area is decreasing. And I think that's something to keep a very careful eye on if you're trying to convince conservationists that productive forestry can be a good thing. And as we've just heard uh, from the, the, the lady from Austria, the importance of putting, um, of getting a, uh, a uh, use of timber in our construction sector, cross laminated timber, other things like that is incredibly important and I think could help change this narrative again about how forests are, are all about carbon storage, even when they're cut down. If those, uh, those planks, that timber is used in construction, it is held. So I think the just the final thing is uh, farming and forestry have often been seen to be very opposed, particularly, I would say, by the common agricultural policy, who often uh, pose them as, as opposites. And even an area shaded by a tree wasn't um, eligible for uh, for subsidy. Now, that is changing. And I think the European agricultural policy is becoming more forest friendly. And certainly, as the science on things like uh, agroforestry and silver pasture develops, I think that is very, very important. But I think the important thing is to change the narrative away from simply conservation and preservation to the idea that conservation and utilisation can go hand in hand. That is a more complicated story to tell, but I think it's very important for the forestry business and in the end for the whole success of the bioeconomy. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tom, very much for the nice insights and really diverse insights on trees and forests. Uh, I'm sure we come back to your points later in the session and seminar. But now I would like to invite Chris to share his views from the science perspective. Chris, please, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to present today. Uh, my name is uh, Professor Christopher Raymond. Um, uh, as Laurie mentioned, I'm a Professor of Sustainability Science at the University of Helsinki. Um, I'm just going to uh, share my screen here, if I can manage to find the right screen. Um, uh, <clears throat> here we go. So, um, uh, Laurie's asked me to uh, discuss today the role of scientists in shaping uh, the politicians and public views on forest and their use. And what we heard from Tom is that, and I agree with him, that uh, public perception of forests uh, is, is, is generally very positive. But uh, I think just in direct response to his thesis, um, 
I would have to question, is that care always getting through to the political arena? Just to give you an example of this in Australia, which is where I'm originally from, we've recently seen the, um, the New South Wales National Party threaten to walk away from its coalition with the Liberal Party over new laws to protect uh, koalas and uh, other biodiversity in forested areas because... Um, the issues around biodiversity is largely a political wedge issue uh, that divides uh, across party lines. Um, and so I think there's uh, we need to look at forestry uh, on one hand, but also the biodiversity conservation uh, as another important aspect. And they are in, in many ways coupled together uh, in, in, in how we uh, uh, appreciate forests and um, there is a tendency at political levels to decouple those aspects and arguably we need to uh, look at forestry management and biodiversity management hand in hand in order to address issues like the sixth mass extinction of biodiversity which we're currently seeing across the planet. Um, in uh, my uh, previous research um, I I've been looking at this uh, knowledge uh, practice gap uh, in conservation, particularly in biodiversity conservation. And what we find is that uh, this gap is is really complex to, to really understand. It's not only about uh, the assumption that there's lack of information uh, informing political or, or communication agendas, but there's a whole range of other things at play, such as the nature of evidence, the, the, the partnerships between researchers and policy makers, the decision context, the researchers and research organisations involved, the capacity of different management organisations, the stakeholder values and beliefs, as well as the wider community or as what has been put forward today as the, as the public, but in terms of their views around a, a given topic, whether it is forestry use or management. And arguably that there is this coupling that needs to be considered between research production and research use if we are to ensure that science really informs the both the political debate and public debate in new ways. Um, and, it, it, so and, and so my thesis today is that if we're going to really couple the research production and research use side, we have to move towards more of a, um, a, a transformative approach to um, knowledge and science, i.e. moving from a pure scientist who just provides information or science arbiter who serves as a resource, resource for the decision maker to a transdisciplinary and action-oriented scientist who weaves together different forms and systems of knowledge and helps set agendas regarding the valuation and management of natural resources from different starting points. What do I really mean by that? Well, a few years ago, I published a paper with colleagues called Knowledge Weaving for Sustainability. And essentially what we're arguing here is that we not only need to mobilise scientific knowledge, but we also have to mobilise local, indigenous and other forms of knowledge relating to different issues. And then we as scientists need to have the capabilities to translate the complexity of that science into key messages relevant to different stakeholders and different public interests. In addition, we need uh, processes for negotiating power relationships and vested interests and uh, uh, through dialogue, be able to synthesise the outcomes of those processes in ways that are meaningful for uh, forestry application or other natural resource ap applications. But that implies a strong partnerships between actors, uh, that includes the stakeholders with a vested interest in forestry, the institutions that help regulate and manage the forestry sector, and the processes of engagement between different uh, stakeholders, including scientists and the community. But uh, as part of my work in IPES more recently, I've started to problematise the role of science uh, in this whole process, recognising that there is not only one form of scientists. Um, as scientists, we carry normative views that are not value free and therefore different perspectives. We can have different perspectives on any given phenomena leading to different messages to politicians and the public and the potential for conflicts and confusion. 
and we've seen this recently in debates regarding uh, the rates of global warming, as well as adaptation responses, as well as in debates regarding how we should best conserve our biodiversity into the future, e.g. in Finland between conserving forests uh, and for carbon sequestration and biodiversity versus the, the so-called sustainable use of forests for the bioeconomy. And interestingly, if I can, um, I, I did some research uh, on the 90 IPBES experts involved in the current values assessment, and we asked them about uh, their uh, what we call uh, ontological beliefs, or in other words, uh, their view on reality. And we divided the, these beliefs across pragmatists who um, uh, embrace problem-centered, pluralistic and real-world practice-oriented characteristics, post-positivists who uh, rely who value determination and reductionism, uh, theory verification, empirical observations, constructivists uh, emphasize multiple dissident meanings, social and historical construction and theory generation, and this transformative uh, worldview that indicates intentions towards change, politics, collaboration and justice. And essentially all four views were present among scientists uh, in this IPBES values assessment. But the important point to show in this uh, table here is that um, uh, different uh, uh, scientists have different views or different motivations for being part of the assessment. For example, pragmatists had a stronger focus on integrating diversity of values than post positivists, but they also had different views on how knowledge should be confirmed, uh, whether it is through bridging, bringing together scientific knowledge with other types of knowledge, whether it is empirical observations through case studies. And they also had different views on the multiple values of nature. Some were emphasizing more the relational values, others were emphasizing more the economic values, or, or others were talking more broadly about the meaning of nature. So there is a lot of diversity even among scientists. So um, before we um, go back, before we start to uh, talk about um, the the role of science in informing uh, political and public debate, we also need some reflexivity among scientists themselves about how we communicate our messages and whether we can de develop a level of cohesion among us. And so therefore, I suggest we need to move towards more of a coherence perspective, which is similar to what uh, I believe Tom was suggesting, that we need to find ways of uh, identifying levels of coherence uh, in views across disciplines um, so that we present um, at least similar messages around how we value forests or value nature and what what this means for the different trade-offs uh, for uh, the management of natural resources going forward. Um, but that also requires the capacities uh, to be built among policymakers um, and as well as among media so that we move from just uh, a single, um, what you might call, optimised view of reality to recognising the importance and validity of plural perspectives in forestry use and management going forward. So I, I think I'll uh, leave it there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Chris. Uh, very interesting. Uh, we have still seven minutes for this session, and I, I would start uh, questioning both of you, uh, kind of a personal questions that relates to science and media. So, Tom, when you are uh, doing your programs, and uh, I wonder how much science is influencing uh, your programs and maybe also personally your views on on forest and i would like to uh, chris follow up with the question that how is media shaping your work and your views of uh, forest so please tom could you start I think probably not enough is the answer to your question. I'd like science to inform it more. And quite often I am battling with my own editors saying, you know, you're going with uh, a, a sort of preconception, uh, you know, a public uh, view on this, almost a prejudice about something, whereas the science doesn't necessarily back it up. But there is also room for some uh, 
room for some interesting storytelling within that. So we did a story the other day on the question about whether we should put a lot of our farmland over to forest, whether if we had a more plant based diet, we could put a lot of pasture, pasture land into forestry and whether this would be good in terms of climate, which is a really interesting question. And actually, you know, all the all the assumptions are that trees are always better than pasture when it comes to carbon storage. But when you actually began to look at some of the 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 science behind this, some very interesting work looking at whole field runoff analysis from carbon. When you take a pasture field and turn it into forestry, certainly initially you get the most massive kind of carbon dump into the uh, into the natural environment, which is something to be avoided. And actually, I think the program in the end helped people to realise that there was some interesting um, science behind what certainly mature and certain types of grazed pasture land can do um, to, to store carbon. So um, science does inform, but I have to be honest and say that uh, prejudice and cliche often has the upper hand. Thank you, Tom. And Chris? Yes, thank you. I, I think the media plays a, a crucial role in informing the discussions between science and society. And I think this was clearly highlighted in the IPBES Global Assessment uh, where when there was the release of the summary for policy makers. And IPBES uh, dedicated a lot of attention to some simple sound bites that media could adopt relatively quickly, such as we, uh, the world is now experiencing the sixth mass extinction of, of biodiversity, which led to a massive political discussion and societal discussion. Um, but that one message was underpinned with all this science. Uh, so that, I think that's a, a crucial example of the role of media in diffusing messages across a society very quickly. And that then led to a lot of other discussions that we're currently seeing with the uh, recent endorsement of the EU biodiversity strategy. Uh, we now have some of the most ambitious targets with 30% of the marine and terrestrial areas to be converted to protected areas, uh, marine and 30% of marine and terrestrial areas to be converted to protected areas by 2030, uh, and also a doubling of uh, uh, biodiversity conservation uh, targets uh, across Europe, which is also now filtering into the, the global uh, framework. And, and um, so I think media plays a crucial role, but um, I think I would like to emphasise, though, that um, and I'll, I'll draw upon the, the new BBC director's uh, points that he said that uh, often there is a tendency in journalism to push personal, or at least has been in the BBC, a tendency to uh, push personal viewpoints, not and, and those viewpoints are not always grounded in, in science. Uh, but arguably also I think scientists um, uh, uh, have a, sometimes push personal viewpoints through perspectives which are not always grounded in science. So I think we all need to perhaps critically reflect, i.e. both media and scientists, on how we uh, uh, position our viewpoints in the public realm. Perhaps we both need to reflect upon the role of different forms and systems of knowledge and different forms of evidence uh, in our messaging going forward. Thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Chris. Uh, there's a lot of interesting questions coming out from the chat, but unfortunately we have used our time and hopefully we can come up uh, back with some of the questions in the questions and answer session in the end of the seminar. So thank you, Chris and Tom and Virpi, it's your turn. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lauri, Tom and, and Christopher for your for your discussion. Really, really interesting. We have five minutes time for for the comments and questions from the audience. First, uh, I would uh, ask Chris. Uh, Camilla uh, Wiedmark asks, uh, Chris, can you please provide some references to your study to read more on this interesting topic? Yes, certainly. Um, uh, so my PowerPoint, which I uh, presented on today, has some interesting references, and that can be made public um, to to everyone in 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 
uh, well, not only in this chat, but also on the website. Um, I, I, I think there are some, the whole area that I'm talking about here is this post-normal science agenda, which talks about the need for action-oriented research, which uh, integrates and weaves together different forms and systems of knowledge, recognising that there's not one right way of uh, conserving forests, but there could be multiple ways. And uh, we, we see this in the fact that there are multiple evaluative frameworks out there for, for and, and of course, related models for understanding forest systems. Um, and so one of the, the messages in this science is that we need ways to converge uh, and bring together these different perspectives in ways that recognise and, and almost celebrate that, that there are going to be conflict sometimes and not assume that there is only one right approach. But I'm happy for that, uh, for the, uh, uh, the person who shared that question to email me and I can follow up with some specific references. Thank you so much, Christopher. And uh, if you want to, you could write the, your references to the to the chat so that yes. everyone can see them very mm -hmm. well. Thank you so much. Then we have a question for Tom. And here is um, a question for you uh, from Jean-Marc Rochard. Isn't it dangerous to make political decisions to Please, public perception that is driven by emotions instead of rationality. <laughs> yes, it is, but that's probably the nature of democracy. Um, <laughs> that's partly what you have to do. Uh, but uh, I think there are important times when, you know, uh, that's the nature of, of leadership, that you need to make the case that there is uh, a, a greater good than just following the immediate whim of uh, of, of the wider public, and um, you know, I, I think uh, that in the in the area of, of, of forestry, I think this is going to be uh, quite important for you know developing a productive forestry sector across more of Europe, because I think you know the, there will be a lot of discussions about. Um, whether that's, you know, whether uh, uh, utilisation, not just conservation, is a good thing. And, you know, that, that is a case for most people which is, which is yet to be made. And yet there is a, there's a great statistic I heard the other day in terms of wood uh, utilisation that um, the sustainable forests of Europe grow enough wood every seven seconds to build a house for a family of four. And uh, when you consider that uh, concrete is uh, eight, it accounts for eight percent of uh, global carbon dioxide emissions, and steel is on top of that, then getting uh, uh, you know getting wood to replace some of this construction effort is incredibly important, and I think is a very is a good way in to making the case for productive forestry, so long as it delivers not only as well, but better in terms of biodiversity and uh, respecting uh, the, the, the rights of the people who live and work there. Thank you very much, Tom. Uh, then uh, we have one uh, question and uh, I would ask to it from Christopher and please, if you could answer quite shortly. Uh, but the question is, how can academia change in order to promote communication and the extra steps for that action-oriented uh, science? Yeah, thank you. Uh, maybe I can give the example here of HELSIS, which is the Helsinki Sustainability Science Institute, which I, uh, I am linked to. And in HELSIS here, we have these um, essentially hubs where researchers and academics from different, different disciplines uh, 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 can be co-located and work together on complex 
uh, global challenges. Uh, we recognise that global challenges are multi-sectoral and multifaceted, and they have interconnected effects. So if we are really going to understand those effects and be able to communicate them to, scientists, to other scientists, but also to policy makers and the media, we need new ways of working together. So I think this is an, this network model is a great example. We also see other examples like the Stockholm Resilience Centre, which is a dedicated institute for interdisciplinary collaboration. And so I think we need to uh, support these structures. Uh, and there are examples of this now in Finland, which can be followed. Uh, and I think um, the, the the University of Helsinki is a great example of, of, of how this is occurring uh, across faculties and uh, 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 across um, disciplinary sectors. Thank you so much, Christopher, for your wise words. Now let's move on. Next, we will have the launch of the newest EFI study. Uh, and the study is called Public Perceptions on Forestry and the Forest-Based Bioeconomy in the European Union. The study will be presented by Lea Ranaher. She is Senior Researcher for Market Analysis and Innovation Research research at Wood K Plus in Austria. Please welcome Lea Ranaher. Oh, hello, welcome everyone. So I'm just going to quickly share my presentation. One minute. Okay, I hope everyone can see the presentation and can hear me. So thank you very much for this nice introduction and opportunity to talk here today. So um, yeah, today I'm going to present you the results of the new EFI study, which is available for download at the homepage. So first of all, I'm going to jump right into the background and motivation for the study. So forests are increasingly important in European policy agenda and also media reporting and public discussion, as they are a very emotional topic, as we've heard before. Forests provide many different services to society, which are exemplified here on this photo. So um, these are recreation, storing carbon, providing wood for societal needs, so timber, raw material. And think in this context about the bioeconomy strategy, which uh, conveys the basic idea of substituting fossil-based materials with bio-based ones and the forest-based sector is a major supplier. As a result of these different services, there are many different expectations towards forests and the forest-based sector. And the question arises, which of these services should be provided and how? And the policy agenda and the discussion on this question is also shaped by the public. Therefore, it's important to know the public perception of forests and the forest-based sector. So, the study here, um, well, addresses the different studies on public perceptions of forests and forestry and the forest-based sector. So it's a meta-study and provides a synthesis of the existing academic literature. Um, what does meta-study mean? Yeah, it means to review the literature on a topic. And this allows you to see which key messages um, result from these studies and which topics have been researched and how. So, um, which studies did we choose for this review? Basically, we were interested in the forest-based sector, so the role of the forest-based sector in a bioeconomy, um, which encompasses the provision of services, products and activities. So this means um, the studies had to relate to these four topics. So the first topic, ecosystem services, refers to forest benefits such as recreation, nature tourism, wood production as well, climate benefits such as carbon storage, biodiversity, and many more. The second topic, forestry, refers to forest management activities that are being carried out to provide these services. The third topic refers to industry, so companies that are processing timber to produce different products. And the fourth topic, products, refers to wood and wood-based products such as construction materials, bioenergy, biochemicals, packaging, and textiles. So in addition to this, um, scope, the service um, had to focus on attitudes, preferences, values or beliefs and had to be based on primary survey data. And of course, the studies had to be conducted in the European Union. And it's a time frame we chose 2010 to 2019, as the last meta study was done in 2009. 
So for more information on the exact methods we used, please refer to the full report. Um, so in total, we identified 77 studies that um, were, fell into these criteria. And on the figure, you can see how these studies are distributed by country and topic. So which kind of research efforts have been made. You can see that there are many multi-country studies here, the left bar. Um, and also most research was conducted in Finland, Germany and Sweden. Regarding the four different topics, there are only few studies on industry, whereas most studies were conducted on forestry and wood products. Note, we also reviewed, um, also we only reviewed studies that referred to the public, such as the population of a specific area, such as country or a specific region, forest visitors, consumers and uh, students as well. Uh, any kind of experts, policy makers or business stakeholders were excluded from the study. Furthermore, the studies were mostly quantitative studies that used convenience sampling. So this means there are the studies that were using a street survey or a simple web-based survey where you just share the link with a certain group of people. Note that this sampling procedure does not allow generalized statements for the population. And overall, um, the reviewed studies are mostly case studies with very specific research questions. So, and owing to the variety of the study aims and the sampling procedures, uh, country and time comparisons are limited. Yeah? So, a general finding is that a more systematic research on public perception is needed to allow generalizations for the European Union. So, now let's come to the results. So, good news is forest ecosystem services are highly valued. So, in total, there were 14 studies dedicated to this topic, and forest ecosystem services can be broadly categorized into environmental, social, and economic benefits. In general, the studies on this topic were carried out in a similar way and mostly survey preferences and importance or knowledge regarding um, forest ecosystem services. And overall, the studies show that forest ecosystem services are highly valued among the public and a lot of people are aware of them. Yeah? This is also a finding of a recent Europe Arometer study conducted by the European Commission. So, um, in all the studies show that the environmental benefits were perceived to be more important than the social and economic ones. And this mostly referred to global, also the impact of forests on the global climate and also on biodiversity. Regarding social benefits, respondents mostly refer to recreational activities such as walking or experiencing um, nature in the forest. And regarding economic benefits, respondents mostly refer to timber protection, but again, this was considered least important by the surveyed respondents. Um, we also checked for significant differences regarding socio-demographic characteristics and we identified that um, women, higher educated and urban citizens and respondents without sector involvement through education, profession or forest ownership more often emphasized environmental benefits. So the topic forestry consisted of 32 studies which addressed attitudes towards forestry in the region. Um, public preferences regarding forest appearance or the acceptance of different management activities. So here the studies were a little bit more diverse. Overall, the studies show public support for forest protection and diverse forests. However, how forests are managed is perceived quite differently. On the one hand, the studies indicate public concern regarding forest conditions, so this relates to forest cover, um, so yeah, the size of forest land, pollution and climate change, and also harvesting activities. On the other hand, forests are also perceived to be well managed and that foresters support forest health. Many studies that reviewed different um, management activities indicate that uh, just a negative perception towards the intensive use. So this refers to clear cuts, but also the use of um, exotic tree species to increase forest growth and the application of chemicals. However, this changed a little bit if these measures were done to protect the forest, so then acceptance rates were higher. Overall, tree planting and protection were rated as important and accepted forest management activities. Regarding the forest appearance, there was a preference for mixed forests and forests with different age classes. So, in other words, people do not like monocultures, 
but I guess this is not a big surprise. Um, regarding deadwoods, this was um, many times perceived to be um, positive, yeah, so to, to be positive also for the recreational value, but in some cases it was also preferred that deadwood is being removed. So here preferences differ a little bit. And this has to do, of course, with regional differences. Regarding significant differences, we found that women, um, higher educated people and younger respondents more often value conservation and diverse forests. So on the third topic, topic of industry, uh, we identified um, four studies. And here, um, these, are, yeah, these are only a few studies. And um, we can say the public perception studies on this topic are currently underrepresented. Yeah, and there is only limited knowledge on this. Um, the studies we found address the perceived sustainability performance of the sector, but still they're rather explorative studies using convenience sample. And so it's difficult to make a clear statement on this topic. But nevertheless, so acknowledging these shortcomings, we can say that the studies indicate skepticism towards the environmental performance of the industry. And there is sustainability of the sector is questioned and people um, are unsure and skeptical whether wood processing companies use certified and legally harvested wood. We also question the environmental responsibility regarding companies' impacts on forest, water and air. However, there was also one study in which the overall sustainability performance of forest industries was rated as good. So then on the final topic, topic of products, we identified 27 studies and the studies focused on the perceived performance of products and the importance of product attributes for purchasing decisions. The studies here focused mainly on traditional products such as construction materials, furniture, flooring, and there were only few studies about new wood-based products such as biofuels, textiles, biochemicals, as envisioned in a bioeconomy. Um, and those dealing with these new bio-based products indicate only little awareness, but nevertheless a positive perception among the public. And yeah, the good news is overall wood products are perceived as environmentally friendly, to be of high quality and healthy. However, positive impacts on the global climate, such as the substitution effect and carbon storage effect, are questioned. And this was especially the case for these new wood-based products, such as biofuels or biochemicals. Regarding the purchasing decision, we found that important product attributes are um, information. So information about safety, labor conditions, wood origin, wood certificates such as PFC, FSC. However, in fact, little is known about the actual purchasing decisions of consumers, as many studies also found other aspects more important. And these were technical performance and price, of course. Regarding significant differences, found that higher levels of income, education and environmental awareness also led to a higher valuation of the quality of wood products and environmental attributes and thus also the purchasing decision. So coming to the conclusion, what's the take home message? So in the eyes of the public, forests contribute to the bioeconomy, wood products not so much. So this question is, is um, yeah, this is a question for the public. Um, just to wrap it up, European citizens perceive forests to be beneficial for the climate and as a place of biodiversity and to experience nature. The economic role of forests, specifically as a provider of raw materials and also to generate regional income, both central aspects in a bioeconomy, was less recognized. Whilst wood products have a good image, their effect on climate change mitigation is questioned. This also relates to the perceived environmental performance of the industry, which is also questioned by the public. So what can stakeholders do to support forestry and forest-based bioeconomy? So at forestry level, stakeholders can support public preferences for environmental benefits and forests and improve the communication on sustainable forest management. So as we've heard before, um, telling the story of conservation and utilizing forest is a complicated story to tell, but it's important to do so. Then at industry level, it's important to communicate product information, also track the development of the product through adequate sustainability assessment. And of course, also to address research gaps. So um, as I said before, there's no systematic research monitoring in the European Union on forestry issues. 
um, and this would be good to, to go more into detail on regional differences. And also regarding the new wood-based products and industry, just to um, yeah, focus research efforts also in this direction, um, how they are being perceived and how the purchasing decision can be, uh, can be better understood. So um, thank you very much yeah, for having me here today. This was a short introduction on the study with an overview about the results and the main findings. So for more detailed findings, please refer to the full report or ask me a question now. Thank you so much, Leah Ranaher, for, for the presentation of the brand new study. We have one question for you from the audience. Uh, Hugo Lindbury asks you, has there been any assessment of where public perception is more or less aligned with the science? Um, well, it was not um, part of my research, but I know about a paper. It's actually a study from Spain where they checked about what's the actual status about um, the forest cover, for example, in Spain, and what's the public perception. And here was found that the perceptions uh, differ strongly regarding uh, specific topics. So yeah, there's definitely research in that area. And I think it would be uh, yeah, a great topic to go into more detail in further research. Thank you so much, Leah, for your presentation and your, and your answer to the question. Thank you. Next, we will move on and uh, we will have a panel discussion on science and interest groups shaping public perceptions on forests. The moderator of the panel will be Kai Lintunen, and the panelists are Jöran Bandes, Silvia Melegari and Linde Zaidema. The moderator of the panel, Kai Lintunen, is head of international communication with the Finnish Forest Association. He is also team leader of the Forest Communicators Network at the United Nations Economic Commission for Europe's Food and Agriculture Organization, as well as the European representative in the FAO Global Forests Communications Coordination Group. Please welcome Kai Lintunen, Jörn Bandes, Silvia Melegari, and Linde Zaidema. The floor thank is you yours. Oh, thank you very much, Pirpi. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Yes, I'm Kai Lintunen, and it is my great pleasure to be your moderator this morning. Uh, we will continue the thread on how science plays a prominent role in affecting perceptions and opinions of the public, and then indeed decision makers. A few weeks ago, broadcaster and naturalist Sir David Attenborough broke world records by reaching a million followers on Instagram in under five hours. And he had a clear message. Saving our planet is now a communications challenge. This is especially true for the world's forests. Forests have a key role to play in helping to achieve many of the SDGs from mitigating climate change by acting as carbon sinks providing innovative bioproducts, food, livelihoods, fuel, shelter, clean water, today name but a few. The challenge is to communicate this to the general public and to change the deep-seated way of thinking about forests. We need to improve understanding of the sustainable use of forests for diverse purposes, not only for the benefit of billions of people, including some of the world's most vulnerable, but also as an elemental means of protecting forests themselves. Science and scientists play an important role in this, although in a current presidential uh, election overseas, some doubt has been cast on whether science uh, or plain intuition is, is more important for decision making. Scientific reports by expert panels and organizations are getting a lot of media exposure. Notably extensive, as mentioned, collaborations such as the Intergovernmental Panel, to, uh, Panel on Climate Change, IPCC reports, and the Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, IPES. These, in part, define uh, how forests are discussed and featured in the media. Research influences how the media perceives forest issues in general, and forest use in particular. 
and how it influences the general public's views on forests. Science and scientists are able to influence the media greatly. As scientists have differing values and points of view, these values may also be seen influencing how research findings are presented to the media. So there are various and often differing views inside the scientific community and between scientists. It can be perhaps even stated that there are scientists that are advocates for various issues, depending on who they work for. Scientists are perceived to be somehow neutral, creating a basis for others to form opinions. For these large-scale assessments like IPCC and IPES reports and, and expert scientific panels, do they lose any of their credibility when scientists begin advocacy on behalf of the findings? Or should more scientists come forward to represent the work as trusted experts? An important aspect is how these reports are portrayed in the media. One of stories or even an extensive exposure of media focusing on the same angle automatically narrows the potential scope of the other findings in these quite extensive scientific works. On the other hand, in most of these reports, forests are actually portrayed as the solution. Maintaining forest biodiversity in many hotspots will help retain other flora and fauna biodiversity. So in order to stop deforestation, we have to be able to cut trees elsewhere in sustainably managed forests. As forests help offset carbon and climate change, and carbon can be stored in long-lived wood products. So, if forests standing on the one hand and forests used on the other hand are all a part of the solution, why is only one perspective very often shared in the media, and that's the negative of forest destruction? These scientific reports actually allow us to broaden the dialogue and the scope of what has been sometimes quite a narrow conversation. So, are the sponsoring organizations missing the mark when they send out press releases or talking points? Or is more communication work needed to help the media broaden their understanding beyond the headline to bring the rest of the science to the public? Ladies and gentlemen, we have an excellent lineup of prominent people for you today, and we have three distinguished speakers. I will only present them by their names and affiliations. For more thorough background info, please refer to the Think Forest website. First off, we have uh, Jöran Bandes, Professor on Biomass and Land Use at the Chalmers University of Technology. He is also a lead author on the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, IPCC, and IEA Bioenergy Task Force. It's interesting, interesting to note that earlier on in, in the program, we had a scientist who is coordinating lead author in one of the IPES working groups. So it's interesting to hear the views from scientists who come from a different research and science policy background and, and have their input in today's theme. Second, Silvia Melegari is the Secretary General of the European Confederation of Woodworking Industries, CEBOIS, and the European Organization of the Sawmill Industry, EOS. Linde Zeidema is the Forest and Climate Campaigner for FERN, an EU-based campaign organization focusing on forests. So, as we're a bit pressed for time, I ask all the panelists to please stick to the 10 minutes, that's allotted to you, and I thank you in advance for adhering to that. So, to kick off the proceedings, uh, I give the space to Jöran Bandes. My question to you, Jöran, is what is the appropriate role of scientists informing these opinions of the people versus the science itself? Yeah, thank you. Easy question. <laughs> uh, I, I actually will use 20 seconds first to apologize now for not having benefited from, from all of the discussions before this panel, because I am jumping in from also other parallel activities. But I, I have listened since half an hour roughly. Uh, uh, I think first I, I, I want to say that, of course, there are 
dangerous for scientists that are at the same time advocates in the sense that our our normal instinct, for instance, to challenge the hypothesis we, we raise uh, is, is maybe changed towards a desire to prove things and pre predetermine the hypothesis and then look for ways to prove it. So in that sense, you, you might enter your research in, in a biased way from the start. Uh, might also be that you you are less interested in learning from from dialogue with colleagues and more focusing on on, on winning debates so to say so so in that sense of course you you need to be very careful with how you approach your work as scientist and at the same time being advocate but having said that i think it's it's very positive that scientists and experts in general contribute to disseminating findings from, for example, the IPCC reports. I think it's it's part of the responsibility actually to try to do that and help to to really make the reports accessible for for the public and for different actors in society. Then of course if if a scientist who is really on fire pushing for a certain issue refers to a report but disseminate a message which is not really supported by the same report then that's that's very problematic it's basically fraud in the same way as others can refer to a big report and claim it says something that it doesn't so so there the scientist is not different to others i think that what might happen possibly a larger risk that is that we as scientists we are are not experts in everything in a big ipcc report and maybe our contribution to dissemination it focuses then on the areas where we are ourselves experts and where we are comfortable and possibly that might give the impression that uh, for instance, if, if you, you, your expertise is in a certain climate change mitigation option and when you disseminate and, and talk about the IPCC report, you spend most of the time discussing your own contribution, you might give the impression of this mitigation option being more central in, as in the conclusion of the whole report than it really is. So, so of course, you, you need to be very careful with how you portray the findings from these big reports. I, a little bit relating to, to what you said about this issue of IPCC and other organizations producing presentation materials themselves, or I think you said talking points or, or key messages. I think that can be good for this reason that we as scientists have something to rely on in our own dissemination activities so we we have an easier time providing a picture of of the synthesis findings if you like maybe as a context before you very very clearly inform the public now i want to talk about my own area and this is just part of the whole report so in that sense i think it's good that ipcc for instance produce uh, press, uh, yeah, PowerPoints, for instance. In in a way, this this uh, way of of uh, leaning against authoritative sources when you send out messages. In, in in my mind, it's it's the same thing as if you are if you are engaging in a public debate. Maybe you write uh, debate articles in in a newspaper. You, you should, uh, if you are, I don't know, professor in Greek history and you write about cancer, you should not sign as a professor with university affiliation and somehow give the impression then on the public that you have huge knowledge in cancer. But possibly you could maybe sign as professor in Greek history or you simply sign with your name. So. All this is a matter of not misusing your position and claim to have authority, which you do not have actually. 
then re specifically related to forest and climate change, one, and we talk about advocacy, I think it's it's also important to recognize that scientists are not only advocates in the sense that we maybe have a specific standpoint on an issue, but we are we are also advocates in the sense that we are basing ourselves on a certain th theory background. We have a certain disciplinary education and a learning period in our institutes. We apply methodology in a certain way. And, the, and in that sense, we are, in, at least implicitly, we are advocates for certain ways of investigating issues and, and looking at issues. And this is often more difficult to see, I think, for the public. And we are too often a bit sloppy in, in declaring our, our background. So, so we, and many times the, the outcome of this, if scientists from different areas engage in a public discourse on an issue, the, the, the general impression is just that scientists seem to disagree. And, and that's, that's a bit sad because maybe there are actually quite many things where scientists do disagree, but that is overshadowed by, by this difficulty of, of reaching each other in a dialogue or even making each other understand our respective entry points to investigating an issue. So here I think uh, here's a real responsibility for scientists to collaborate across disciplines and methodology traditions and and here is also where IPCC and IPES and other large initiatives to to gather s scientific insight is really is really good and i can see also for for related more to yes as as a concrete example where i have seen myself how a dialogue have helped scientists to make progress together that's where uh, people working with life cycle analysis which is very much a often a product focusing uh, way of investigating, uh, for instance, the climate benefit of forest based products. People working within that discipline and collaborating with people working in systems modeling, either covering sectors or cross sectoral modeling and with different geographical scope. Uh, th these are examples of disciplines that have come together in different ways to jointly build a shared view of the issue, which I think is very positive and it's it's an inspiring example. Uh, I don't know how much time I've spent. <laughs> uh, maybe if, since since we talk about uh, here the interaction between science and and journalism and and uh, I think if I had a uh, had a uh, uh, a wish list or, or a proposition for an important role among journalists, then it is to help to disseminate the non-sexy results of science, because that is very difficult. It's very difficult to, to reach out strongly with a message saying that it depends. And this is something that is a challenge for us scientists and I don't believe that we should overcome this by twisting our findings or focusing on certain aspects of our findings that we believe uh, are so uh, th that they are standing out sufficiently to get the attention of journalists and the public but we need to stay true to our work as scientists. And if if it depends, that is what we need to disseminate somehow. I think I stop there for now. Thank you very much, Jeroen. Uh, uh, very straightforward and, and uh, impress impressive insight on, on, as you said, quite a, quite a big question. Um, and more dialogue and more collaboration that that uh, that is uh, uh, sound advice. 
Now we're going to move a bit um, to the forest sector interest organizations and NGOs. On the other hand, uh, they bring forward their respective views on forests and, and natural resource use. And the question is, uh, what is considered credible and by whom? Where can you hear values again play play a big part in this in this definition and, and, and discussion. So as there are these different points of view and, and multiple needs exist, uh, how can we build on these, try to maximize the synergies with these values and, and beliefs and minimize the trade-offs uh, related to these quite often. Uh, next up, we have Ms. Silvia Melegari to shed more light on this. The space is yours, Silvia. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you for your question and invitation to this very interesting uh, seminar. So I would like to start uh, first with, uh, with a matter of fact. In order to maintain the ecological, environmental and economic health of the European forest, a vibrant and competitive forest industry is needed. The lack of diversified and competitive forest product industry to process logs, small diameter timber, or the thinning removed out of the forest may actually undermine the ability of a forest owner or forest manager to uh, maintain uh, the forest uh, uh, in a sustainable manner. But is this perceived by the public? If we look at the uh, Eurobarometer published in September, 70% of the respondent to the question, what do you think is the most important benefit provided by forests, responded that uh, this main benefit is actually uh, to provide a habitat for animals. Only 17%. 19%, sorry, only 19% recognize it, uh, uh, the benefit of raw material supply. And when it came to the question about uh, the rural contribution, the economic rural contribution of forests, only one respondent out of 10 recognizes this added value. The forest-based industry are actually characterized by a wide range of diversity in type, sites, raw material use, product management, and also market requirements. Any change in raw material supply are accompanied by parallel change in processing technology. But this is just in the positive scenario. When we look at the small companies, like it could be small hardwood processing industry, then a change in raw material, a change in price, in quality, or uh, or in availability may actually undermine the survival of this company. Uh, so what we need as first is actually to strengthen information exchange in order to uh, to best management, uh, in order to design the best management and also to define utilization of strategies at the same time to maintain environmental integrity of forest. What has happened in the last year? In the last year, what we have been confronted with, it was uh, an uncoordinated bark beetle epidemics. This was mentioned also by previous speaker, but it is important that is emphasized one more time because um, forests have been attacked by this uh, bark beetle driven by hotter, drier summer, lower rainfall and warmer winters. The harvesting capacity was also a limit factor relative to the annual volume of bark beetle attacked timber. And what is happen, uh, happen? Logs were actually exported to China. In the first eight months of 2020, the shipment from EU to China of logs, I'm talking about logs, rocketed by 115%. Germany increase of 200.2% compared to the previous year, its export of logs, followed by Czech Republic. From a sawmill point of view, instead, the sawmill increased the production and the processing of bark beetle, causing an oversupply on the market and sometimes also lower, creating a lower prices in some markets. So when we hear that actually one of the challenging forests 
is actually uh, the, the human activity and uh, is caused by, let's say, the, the production of wood product. This is actually incorrect. I just would like to recall uh, that uh, Austria, in order to face the dramatic consequences of the bark beetle, was actually planning to propose a kind of an obligation for the sawmill industry to process the damaged wood. But the sawmill industry didn't have this capacity. So what I would like to stress one more time is that the challenge in forests are actually due to the climate change condition rather than human activity. What we should focus is actually improvement of wood supply production. So we should focus our research into forest seeding, species genetic, and particularly on pest controls, how to make our forests more resilient. It was mentioned before the, the role of social media, the role of uh, information. The Economist on the 5th of January 2019 published actually an article in order to emphasize the benefit of using wood compared to other material. And they emphasize actually that the cement making alone produce 6% of the world's carbon emission, while steel, half of which are used in, in construction in buildings, account for another 8%. Um, very recently, also the president of, of the European Commission has actually emphasized that using wood in building may actually turn the construction sector from a carbon source into a carbon sink. So what is actually needed from our sector when it comes to public perception? But we need to need, we, we need to win the hearts and might of citizens, but most of all, we need also to, to win the heart of the European Commission. Our sector needs to find the resources to invest massively in shaping value. Many people are actually simply unaware that uh, through the very production of a uh, wood product uh, of using also the economic side of the, of the forest, uh, we are actually providing the income to forest owner, forest management to maintain a healthy their forest in order to provide not just our raw material, but also social uh, aspect and to guarantee the environmental benefit driven by, by forests. Ordinary people do not know about the substitution effect of wood product, and they do not know most of the time that what is harvested is actually also replanted. So uh, to, to summarize, we need to, to engage in this communication campaign, both at the European and national level, but also we need to maximize our uh, communication to the European Commission in order to emphasize the role of the timber industry in the Green Deal in, in, in achieving the Green Deal objective. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Silvia, for sharing uh, the repercussions of a of a grave occurrence of, of calamities and how how that has been portrayed in the media and the discussion. Now, um, last but not by any means least, uh, we have Ms. Linde Zaudema. Linde, I'd like to pose the same question to you as for Sylvia. As different points of view and multiple needs exist, how can we build on these, try to maximize the synergies, these values and beliefs and, and minimize the trade-offs uh, related to this. Space is yours, Lind. Yes, thank you very much. And thank you very much for the invitation today. I've, I've been following the um, inputs uh, all of this morning and uh, this, is, this is really an interesting kind of meta subject uh, in, in the, the sector and uh, issue that we're all working on. Um, just some preliminary uh, thoughts before uh, before I respond to to that question. Um, Fern is is an organization, as as a lot of the participants will know, that that focuses on on EU policies uh, relating forests. Um, I have myself been working on on bioenergy and bioeconomy uh, issues in in the past years in in that context. 
Um, but more in terms of how we work um, in, in the context of the, the issue that we're discussing today, we work a lot with both uh, the scientific community and partner organizations throughout Europe um, in member states uh, to inform our agenda and positioning. And I also want to stress that um, while doing so, we always remain open and inclusive to discuss those positions and um, the science that those positions are, are based on and are also always open to reconsider statements and, uh, and so on. So we are very conscious of how, um, how we can ensure a dialogue that is on shaping policies uh, that are, are really based on, um, on, on science and the data uh, available to us. Um, so I, I mean, I, I will not go in detail on, on kind of the public perception because um, uh, we, we, we are not a member-based organization and we, we, uh, our ties with, with the public directly is, is, is rather limited, but uh, we do work a lot with civil society throughout Europe. So um, I can give some insights on, on where um, um, conceptual ideas or uh, concerns relating forestry and, and bioeconomy um, might uh, might originate from. So um, uh, Sylvia already pointed out that uh, that uh, the, the results from from the recent barometer, I think in general surveys always show that Europeans place climate and environmental protection quite high on the on the political agenda. Um, um, and I think this is uh, th this is an important uh, consideration in, in also in, in the, the area of forest and, and forest based policies. Um, on, so I will focus on, 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 on three areas so forestry, then bioeconomy and wood products and then sort of kind of the interlinkages with with policies. So to start with forestry, I think that it has been mentioned a few times this morning, but um, uh, one of the biggest concerns is that management seems to have a strong have had a strong focus on biomass mobilization in, in recent years uh, and economic interest and does not always correspond with that priority that people have on on safeguarding um, other ecosystem services or, or match with in that sense with climate and environmental goals uh, in the in the long run. And I, th I think this is not necessarily only kind of an, an emotional point of view, as, as some have have may have have suggested. I think that it is based in science and the trends show that there are um, that that forests are are in a bad shape in in a lot of uh, regions in the EU. So I'm, I'm sure that that a lot of uh, participants today are are um, are aware of, for example, the EEA report uh, on on the state of nature that came out recently, that shows that uh, that 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 forest biodiversity and habitats are um, in in a bad shape and 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 uh, in 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 some instances in on a deteriorating in trend and and that that specifically accounts for boreal rural region. Um, I think that, that the data also show it, although I think that, that there the, the kind of the public perception, as Sylvia also pointed out, is uh, an understanding is quite limited in relation to, to climate and substitution effect. Um, but, but obviously a, a forest ability to sequester more carbon from the atmosphere is, is declining and, and forests sink are projected to decline further in the, in the coming decade. Um, which which is important for this substitution effect in, in bioeconomy, and I think that to to focus a bit more on that on, on wood products and 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 the bioeconomy, I think that that's also really of kind of fundamental uh, idea that is that is uh, understood by 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 public and by regular folks, if you want. So I think that while wood, in an essence, is seen as an as an as an kind of sustainable raw material. I, I do think that people basically understand that that something that is made, that is produced from uh, biomass does not necessarily equal that is climate friendly or or sustainable in a, in a broader sense. And I think that it, that's in essence because people understand that wood is a limited um, resource and, and a source of carbon. Um, and that's uh, 
I think that, that that's more the scientific point of view. I think, or just the the, uh, the the issue of substitution. I think that um, that as a basis, you can say that the renewability of biomass is is a relative uh, is relative uh, to uh, how these how land, forests, and biomass are are currently already fulfilling a role. Uh, in in uh, in climate change uh, mitigation and what kind of additional uh, uses and uh, in a developing bioeconomy will have on on kind of these the substitution effect. I think in terms of public perception, um, push putting forward new bio-based products as uh, something innovative for that helps in climate change mitigation. I think a big issue there is is verification and burden of proof. Um, I, I've myself worked in the area of bioenergy for, for a long time, and that, that's a key key issue. I think we've seen that between 2000 and 2015, you see bioemissions have, have almost doubled, um, but there is little proof or verification on, on how, uh, how these emissions are, are then compensated for. Um, so that that's an important area, I think, subject in, in the broader uh, uh, bioeconomy debate. And that relates to that that the concept of bioeconomy is quite broad and there seems to be a lack of kind of boundaries or, or priorities regarding end uses. So it's also it's seen as everything and anything and um, and that, uh, that that's not necessarily helpful in 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 in, in I think in, in terms of the public uh, perception, especially when you look at the trends where you see that uh, that uh, wood use is going perhaps more towards short-lived uh, wood products over over time, um, which is also concerning from from resource efficiency perspectives and uh, objectives and and. Um, and, uh, and and a long-term energy transition. Um, so what I'm saying is that um, uh, you see that in some member states, you see, for example, that biomass use is, is a barrier for more innovative and cleaner energy technologies. And I think that that, that people understand that that's not, not necessarily helpful in the, in the long run. And, and then there are obviously other negative impacts um, in relation to 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 biomass use, such as air pollution and 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 market distortion, um, so and then there there is an international dimension uh, when we're using more biomass and or wood from from in, in our economies, we might need to rely increasingly on on imports, um, which is problematic in in terms of um, land tenure rights and and, uh, and 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 deforestation elsewhere. So how is this linked to to kind of the, the policy framework? I think that these concerns are are only reinforced by how the current policy framework is set up. Um, I think that uh, the current climate and biodiversity ambition is not backed up by by policies. Uh, there is a really unbalanced incentive and regulatory framework that has a strong focus on wood mobilization and use for energy and short lived uh, uses. Um, I think that, that that that's a personal remark, but I think that from an EU perspective, the member state discretion in how to allocate certain funds is an issue, is an issue that, that should be discussed uh, in terms of the broader objectives that we have in how we uh, how we how we manage forests and how we use uh, how we use wood. But perhaps more importantly, I think in, in relation to bioeconomy and the lesson learned from the bioenergy debate is that in the context of the incentive structures that we have that are uh, that are perhaps going to do kind of the, the more short-lived uses of wood, uh, the externalities are, are not, not adequately factored in. So in terms of costs related to biodiversity losses, air pollution and greenhouse gas emissions, they are just additional costs to the public support that we are uh, allocating to to this kind of new uh, new bio waste products, so that that's an that's an issue. So uh, th these are just some some factors that I think that that will have an effect or that do have an effect on public perception. I myself I'm I'm from the Netherlands and we have had a long debate in recent years on 
the use of wood for energy, and these relate to all of these elements that, that I've tried to, to reflect on. So I'll leave it here, and thank you so much for, for the invitation. Thank you very much, Linde. Uh, a very, very uh, thought-provoking talk. Um, I think we have a lot of questions waiting for us from, from both the journalists and, and the audience. So I'll just uh, wrap up real soon. We, we heard Jöran say that, that uh, scientists shouldn't uh, claim authority where they aren't one and, and they are advocates of, of, of certain theories and, and for ways of investigating issues and, and then that the uh, scientists are mindful of, of what their position and, and what their authority is in moving minds. And then to the interest organization discussion, uh, there, there were big, as, as these are big questions, and we went partly to the policy uh, side of things. But but I heard in, in all of these uh, speeches the, the need for collaboration and openness for, for dialogue and, and, and open and readiness to, to reconsider points uh, in, in a, and, and a call for factual dialogue. And, and uh, because these issues are, as, as Tom already pointed out, that the uh, tree and forest related issues are, are easily quite emotional. And, and the discussion is, is, is very broad. So we have to be mindful on, on uh, where, how, where, how to how to uh, balance the, the emotion and, and, uh, and, and the factual evidence. With these, I, I will now turn. Uh, thank you very much for all of the three panelists. You, you, you tackled enormous questions really bravely and, and, and to the point. And uh, with this, I will uh, turn over to Virpi and she will start unloading the wealth of, of, of questions from the audience and uh, over to you, Virpi. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kai and the panelists for your perfect, perfect discussion. Also, you have uh, elevated the discussion in the in the chat and uh, before taking the questions from the chat, we'll take one question from the media. There will come Borut uh, Tavchar, uh, he is specialized journalist in environment, energy and mobility at DLO. And he's going to ask one question. Uh, Bob Bervin, who was going to ask one question, do uh, he has a some technical issues, so he's not being there, but we have then more time for questions from the audience. But now, please welcome Borut Tavchar. Uh, thank you for, for the words. Can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, I'm from uh, Slovenia. We are like 60% uh, under forest and our forestry is dominated by climate change, I think. So bark beetles, uh, hail and, and spruce is uh, almost uh, doomed in our, in our country. So how to, how to cope with that? Because studies say uh, like uh, younger forests, are are storing more CO2 than old forests, but but the most resilient forests are mixed, mixed like uh, in species and in and in I don't know age of forests. Uh, how to how to connect? All, all these issues in, in, in one sound bioeconomy concept. I don't, I don't think that's possible. <clears throat> Was it directed to someone specific or, or are we 
entering on free will. <laughs> I think the question and answer session was was uh, dedicated to all the speakers along the day on, on the webinar. Isn't that right, Vicky? So, yeah, I can start if you like. Uh, one one uh, just just for clarification also uh, of the question, I I understood that you said that that young forests are storing more carbon, but at the other hand, you have resilience maybe from a mixed uh, a mixed forest in terms of species and age structure and so on. But I think when it comes to carbon storage, it's it's also a good example of where we scientists are all too often unclear what we talk about so so we can talk about carbon storage as as a process going on all the time and then as you say young forests are growing faster so therefore also assimilate more carbon per year but on the other hand the older forests are as a storage of carbon they are larger so in that sense we we need to keep these two things apart because it's it's a matter of also understanding what our objectives are with forestry, whether we want to store a lot of carbon in the forest, or if we want to have the forest to a larger extent being a process, ma maintaining a process of assimilating carbon, and actually taking out the carbon out of the forest through the harvest and producing products. So these are two different things. Having talked a lot about forest uh, carbon, I. I okay now now I'm just throwing out things that's the fun part of being in a panel and getting unexpected questions I think we focus too much on the carbon dimension uh, of forests and forestry all of us and and that in 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 ideal situation we f we focus on all the other values of forests and forestry the the environmental values, the cultural values, and the economic values, and and the carbon comes as a consequence. I'm I'm pretty nervous about us jointly establishing a, a regime where the carbon dimension is extremely strong. I don't think the carbon argument is sufficiently strong for those that wants to protect environmental values of forests, for instance. I think it's it's a mistake to rely on the carbon argument as being a strong one and not fight sufficiently for the other values. So in that sense, I think uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I would prefer to, to a little bit downplay the carbon dimension of the whole uh, concentration of forests because it's so much broader and bigger. I didn't answer your question now, but I, I think I provided maybe some appetite for others in the panel and earlier today to answer or debate this. Thank you, Jeren, so much for your for your thoughts. What about the others? What do you say? Linda. If, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm happy to comment. I think I have the idea that Sylvia's frozen, but let's. Um, yeah, I think, I mean, relating to, to the question, um, I think from our perspective as Fern, uh, we, we are very happy to see that forests are higher on the political agenda. Um, the recognition that, um, that forests need to, to in Timmermans' words, step up in terms of its their role in, in climate change mitigation but um i would agree that 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 the 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 effect uh, the issue of resilience is is key in in this debate and um that that really relates on to the question how we can ensure that that forests are, are basically managed um 
more in uh, to yeah with with the objective to also improve their resilience uh, over time um i think in, in to respond to an earlier question about uh, our the need for collaboration and, and inclusive dialogue um and the, the relevance of science uh, i think that there are several things to, that i wanted to 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 mention still so one is that, that i think that um from from Fern's perspective, there is a need for a open discussion that is um, based in in the idea of or in um, having in mind the the political uh, objectives uh, and the crisis both on the climate and biodiversity side. In that sense, I I, I tend to disagree with the previous speaker on. Uh, on, on the aspect of carbon, because I think that it's not only the carbon issue that makes a difference in forest management as such, but also in wood products and prioritization on, on that side. So may, maybe I've misunderstood, but I, I think that, that the carbon aspect remains one of the issues um, to take into consideration. Um, but but all in all, I think that that science uh, remains uh, should remain a key issue the, 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 uh, or driving factor into to the policy debate. The, the question is how you connect it because regula regulation and regulatory options to consider there are obviously a, a lot of other things to 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 take in, into consideration. How regulate like what what kind of effect different types of regulations have on 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 whether it's forest management or the use of wood in an, in a forest based sector and um, uh, and and so on so so i think those are um, are are important uh, maybe as a as a final remark i i i think that we will remain having a discussion about forests and and the forestry sector um, with a lot of stakeholders that come at the debate from a different uh, interest and, and thus have different kind of paradigms in how they frame certain issues. Um, I think that will remain the case. The only thing you can do is also um, be considerate of that, uh, of that and try to ensure that you have um, uh, uh, that you see common ground on, on, on certain issues going, uh, going forward. Thank you. Thank you so much, Linde, for your for your comment. Uh, is there somebody else who would like to answer to to Borut's brilliant question? Maybe if I may compliment, I'm so sorry I disappeared because we had an internet problem. So we lost internet at the other side of the building, but now I should have fixed it. As I said during the presentation, we are aware that the situation in some country, not only Germany, Czech Republic, Austria, but Slovenia as well, have been dramatically affected by this bark beetle propagation. And uh, as a very first response, uh, in addition to research, as we said, we need to do more research in the seedling, species and genetic, what is going to survive in our forest, in a forest that is changing due to the climate change uh, um, that is occurring. We also need uh, some new instrument for doing the pest control. How can we monitor the propagation of the bark beetle? We need projection in order to understand how bad the situation is going to evolve. But also hardwood species are affected, and in particular are affected of growth of the soil. Um, so we need more research. We need also more funds to forest owners because they need to have uh, the financial support in order to harvest when there are uh, this uh, problem, to replant, and this it must be profitable for them. Because as we said already, it's not just about the human activity, it's also about really what climate change is uh, it's, uh, it's occurring. And then the, the, the wood industry will respond to all this, uh, because if we know how is the situation in the forest, we can also make a new business plan in order to adapt to the new wood species that will be available. And when, for example, pest or uh, uh, natural calamities like the via storm will occur, we will have the, uh, the resources and the understanding 
in order to tackle the, the problem, to purchase this wood and then to put it on uh, in the market. So it is not correct when we say that uh, uh, we are using too much wood. As I said before, actually, we are exporting logs because our industry is not able, it doesn't have the capacity to process all these resources. So another step is to create a, a strong demand for wood products in order that when calamities happen, when the bark beetle happens, we can buy, use this resource and put it in, a, in the market as environmentally friendly material. Thank you. Thank you so much, Silvia, for your, for your comments. Uh, I think that we go further for the next question. And uh, the question is from Janice Burns. Uh, and uh, she asks uh, from Tom Heap and the journalists, what is your view on the role of regular programming like Country Life and Country File, sorry, and, coast, and Coasting the uh, Earth? in shaping public perception on forests compared to headline news, for example, elections, fires, and so. Please. Uh, that, that's to me, yeah? Yes. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> I'd nearly wandered away. I was I was uh, writing, but not so much listening. But thankfully, I heard you, uh, Virpi, so that's good. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I, I I think in the end, I mean, th there's the obvious point to make that the regular programs can go deeper because they're on for half an hour or, or 12 minutes in the case of the country file film. But I do think there's there's something else that um, if you take a, a, a program like country file as a broad popular audience, it's not broadcasting specifically to an expert audience. It's on BBC One, our national popular channel. And I think it's a good place to 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 tackle and sometimes correct cliches that are widely held in the public. So, you know, if you can um, uh, talk about, say, in, in, in this issue, you know, if you can go and show a, a productive forest that has great wildlife and, and is making construction timber, and you can hope to help to, to square that circle uh, with the idea that it that forest, you know, productive forestry can be, uh, can be good for the environment as well, you can, I mean, I, I remember actually doing a piece to camera in Country File. This is where you address the camera and something's happening in the background. And a tree was actually falling behind me. It was actually being cut down behind me. And the question I was posing to the audience is, is that always environmentally a bad thing? What's happening over my shoulder? And so you can start conversations with a broad audience in that in, in that kind of environment. Um, and in uh, the radio program, Costing the Earth by Its Nature, it tends to have a slightly more expert, um, uh, slightly better educated audience, and it's quite good for nudging policymakers. So if you want to start a discussion on, or, or be part of a discussion, I should say, on something, for instance, we had a very interesting program, it wasn't one actually that I made, but it was in the series about the relative merits of uh, planted forestry versus regenerated forestry uh, in, in terms of environment and, and, and climate. And uh, I think that, you know, it made the point that, you know, planting, you know, can be good and can be done right, but it also can be done really badly. And you shouldn't just always think that natural scrub and something that we didn't get involved in is, is a bad thing. Sometimes, you know, <laughs> nature can deliver some fantastic forests without us necessarily getting involved. So I think it was quite a good uh, nudge for sort of policymakers who are thinking about this 10, 20, 30 million trees a year and thinking about how you actually deliver them. Thank you so much, Tom. That, that was great. Uh, what about uh, the others? What about Borup? Would you like to say something to that question? As a journalist. Well, forests are really important in, in, in uh, Slovenia. I just wrote a, a, a story on a, a forest in, in cities that, uh, that can uh, provide shade in, in hot uh, summers, the best shade, uh, the need for corridors, for green corridors in, in cities, for birds and, and for fungi and, and stuff. I think 
this is the major topic in 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 in, in Slovenia and and it probably should be in many countries but now everything is under under this covid-19 so i am sorry not n- no other information really gets gets out but in 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 other other times forests are extremely important also also fires that happen around the world we are very sympathetic yes thank you so much for you took up that covid-19 here and uh, previously i can't find it right now from the chat we are uh, over 130 participants i can't find that question but but I remember that there in the chat box was a question about the COVID-19 and the forests. That uh, how do you see your specialists, scientists, and uh, and policymakers? How do you see that uh, the COVID-19 is affecting to public perception on forests? Who wants to take? that can i say something yes it's very important forests are very important for recreation now so it's the first the first i don't know uh thing to go to and to to clear your mind uh with all these restrictions that we are follow we have to follow Thank you, Borut. What about the others? I'm happy to briefly comment. I, I mean, I, I don't know about the, the kind of the, the, the public perception, but I think that the, the recovery is is, an, is a very important topic uh, at, the, at the moment. Uh, and the, the question how we use um, the, the rel- relative funds uh, in in the context of a broad range of, of policy objectives uh, while ensuring that that there is an economic economic recovery and I think for for a bioeconomy that that's that's an opportunity but it also involves uh, very yeah very difficult choices I think and uh, and I think that, that in the EU, their uh, member states will will have to deploy uh, strategies where they um, look at the, where they use relative funds for recovery more into those sectors that can truly innovate and and help uh, to to have that spillover effect from. Uh, from uh, public funds in the in the broader economy, so uh, that that means a certain prioritization in in uh, in certain sectors, um, which which I think is is important. So I think that that it that it has also clear links in in relation to green deal ambition across the board, uh, competition rules, uh, how to to deploy state aids uh, and and EU funds both in. In forestry and um, and and uh, in different sectors. So, and uh, to to say that, you know, I th- I think that from our perspective, in that sense, it's always important to look at it holistically, uh, to both look at consumption and consumption patterns, as as was already discussed earlier today, um, at at sourcing, mobilization, and and. Uh, sustainable production and uh, and as I said at, at kind of the end users and um, uh, and circularity as well and I think that the recovery there can can do a lot in help enhance um, enhance uh, on on those uh, on those uh, aspects. Thank you. Thank you so much, Linde and uh, and Borut that uh, Borut's uh, recreational uh, aspect and value is very, very nice, so that you you took it up. Uh, Next question from the chat is, uh, it's something that there has been a really, really uh, great discussion in the in the chat. And uh, Bernard, uh, the Galambert is asking, 
how to make scientists and researchers more interested in making their findings and research understood than seeking for a praised peer-reviewed paper in a scientific journal that will only be read by their peers. And he says it in other words. My question is how to make scientists move away from their comfort zone, which often preserved, perceived as either arrogance or compliance. So, what about this question? I can, I can maybe start answering. Uh, if, if we look just very kind of narrowly on, on the what is really rewarded for you as a scientist, maybe that's part of the problem that that you are judged based on how you publish, where you publish, and and that type of performance is as I, I would say it's it has much larger weight than really providing the other type of service to society, which is what you ask for, and that is to try to make the science more accessible and understood and therefore also to invite uh, others than the scientists themselves in discussing the issues. This is not easy, I should say at the same time. So so it's, it's maybe a conversation that scientists need to have with other uh, experts than, than the other experts in their own field because you know how it is. I mean, everything that you are good at, you cannot understand how others can believe it's difficult. I mean, if when you can ride a bike, you cannot understand how anyone cannot ride a bike. And it's, it's I think, part of, of the challenge here is to really understand what is difficult for others to really, to really understand from your science and how you define it. One example before I finish, the, the use of different metrics in describing the climate effect of different mitigation options, like how do different mitigation options contribute to mitigation? And you can describe that with a lot of different metrics. That's an area where the IPCC is is constantly working to try to, to uh, understand how different metrics are complementary. This is a very internal science, internal discussion maybe, but it's also one of the key means for communicating to others, to the general public. And maybe the one problem here is that the metrics that we believe are very, use, very useful for our own understanding can be very difficult to really understand for for general public unless you put a big effort in explaining them. So that's one example where we can really be careful in trying to be pedagogic. Thank you. Thank you, Jöran. Uh, next, uh, Tom Heap will say something also, please. I spend a lot of time talking to uh, scientists and trying to get them to clarify things for the general public and often persuading them to talk as well. There is no doubt that it requires a certain amount of bravery and a little bit of charming arrogance, I'd say, on behalf of scientists who want to do this, because they will be asked to talk in a language that is not the language that they would talk to their peers in. They will be asked to, to use phrases to, to describe things which is not the same as they'd use in a scientific paper. And they need to know that that, that you know that if someone criticizes you know one of their scientific peers criticizes them well you know frankly they can go and take a hike they weren't talking to them they were they were talking to the the public so you do need a bit a slightly thick skin in order to deliver this you also do need to think about language really you know if you're explaining this to your mate down the down the pub in the cafe to a sort of 16 you know a bright 16 year old child would you be using that language and uh, th th that's just something to, to, to think about. If you want your uh, point to, to, to get across, we all change the way we speak according to the groups that we're in. Uh, you know, all the time we do that. And scientists, just because they're on the media, don't think they need to go all, you know, terribly formal and terribly processed. 
they need to think about the audience that they're, they're speaking to. And lastly, it's not for everybody. <laughs> you know, it just isn't, you know, so, and, and there's perfectly valid scientists who do the most brilliant science who would be terrible at speaking about it to the public and they're great scientists and they're to be cherished as well. So it isn't for everybody, but yeah, just it requires a, a bit of bravery and thought and, 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 and preparation. And I would just big up an organ, very briefly, an organization in the UK called the Science Media Center. I think there's one in Germany as well, certainly one in Australia, which is an, all about getting scientists and journalists together and letting each tribe know how the other one works in general and on specific stories actually cooperating on uh, how to, to best get them across. And uh, to the point earlier about uh, non-sexy science, it does talk about how to do that and how to do, um, how to communicate doubt, how to, to communicate uh, uncertainty and variability in, in answers, not simply simplifications. Thank you so much, Jöran and Tom. Now it's time to conclude the webinar. Please welcome Think Forest President Janic Potocnik. Thank you, Virpi. In short, uh, excellent presentations, contributions and discussions. And yes, Terhi, memories on Nagoya are still very much alive also on my side. Nice days when our beliefs in multilateralism after Copenhagen failure were revived again. Before focusing on substance, and since we have heard the word IPCC and IPBS so many times in this webinar, and since I'm co-chairing another sister UN-related science policy interface, International Resource Panel, I would advise you to look also at our work too. We are focusing on natural resource management and natural resources are actually the bridge between the economy and competitiveness on the one hand and climate change, biodiversity loss, pollution and health implications on the other. And without addressing the drivers and pressures leading to climate change and biodiversity loss, we will simply not solve the problems. But let me now try to draw some conclusions based on the excellent uh, study presentation and other inputs from the colleagues not an easy thing to do. I have divided conclusions in two groups, one which are more general, valid, all, valid for all the areas linked to sustainability efforts and perceptions, and others more forest and bioeconomy specific. First about the general ones, which are not uh, only linked to forest, but also to forest, forestry and bioeconomy. As mentioned by Kai, David Attenborough, summarized it nicely. Saving the planet, it's now communication problem. Public, it's quite, it's quite environmentally consciousness, but it does act and react many times quite intuitively due to the lack of information, knowledge, understanding, and also complexity of the sustainability related questions and dilemmas. It is essential to educate, inform, and empower them. Women and young generation, as we have heard from the study, are particularly concerned and also ready for change in the sustainability direction. Young generation is less locked in protecting existing vested interests. Many in my generation are satisfied only if we own a comfortable house and a big car, while youngsters are already happy by sharing a warm place to stay and be mobile. They are also very digitally literate, which leads me to the next point. We did not talk today about it a lot, but digitalization as an enabler for data collection, analysis, information sharing, it's a major opportunity for improving transparency and empowerment of consumers and society at large. This was not possible just a few decades ago, and it's potentially should really be uh, fully seized. But when discussing the importance to understand how public perceptions are shaped, one should also address the role of digitalization in relation to social media facilitation. As much as useful it can be, the developments there are far from black and white. It can rap rapidly and effectively spread also disinformation generate perceptions that increase the tensions within the society and feed on acting instantly rather than calmly waiting things and different perspectives. 
we have evidence that even governments use systematically social media to generate perceptions that are in line with their interests. We would certainly need to minimize such impacts, create more patient social media culture to understand and value different perspectives. This is, of course, relevant also when discussing and shaping the perceptions we create about forests, forestry and bioeconomy. If we draw the lesson from the compass mentioned in my opening linked to economic ecosystem, one thing is clear. Economic ecosystems are interlinked like ecosystems in nature. Forests do not function in isolation from other environmental ecosystems as well as bioeconomy does not function in isolation from other economic areas. Forests are connected and related, for example, to water and air systems, to biodiversity and climate challenges, and I could continue. And bioeconomy, it's connected to all the areas providing human needs from nutrition, housing, mobility, and other consumer needs, as well as to those enabling them, energy, materials, and innovation, digitalization. While some natural ecosystems are indeed more local than others, this does not change the fact that they are interrelated, which should be also taken into account when we create policies and governance solutions to effectively address challenges we face. And finally, from this general group, any technical, social, economic and environmental performance of existing and future innovations, as well as tracking their development through sustainability assessments, should be transparent and well communicated in advance. This is valid for all innovation related questions to anything new and unknown. Any investment in trust building in advance, as substantial as it would be, is insignificant comparing to the investments needed if something would go wrong or would be at least perceived as being harmful and dangerous. Now, finally, a few conclusions which are more forest and bioeconomy specific, but some, of course, also still generally valid. Countries are not equally covered by forests and also perceptions of public to forest, forestry and bioeconomy related questions naturally differ. While in principle, sustainability approach to forest is valid and should be respected everywhere. These differences should be taken into account in particular when we want to address public perceptions. This should be an important part of the education, communication and empowerment strategy. The point of departure, as mentioned by Tom, is trees are universally loud. This empathetic relationship provides remarkable public unity. The narrative of conversation is very strong in a majority of countries. And from the study, we have learned that people prefer mixed forests, as mentioned by Leah, not a surprise. Also due to that, a precondition for the bioeconomy to be acceptable for public is that it is sustainable and contributing to sustainability efforts. This does not happen automatically. Biofuels and biochemicals are not supported by public, as we have heard. The impact on climate change is questionable. And economic benefits of forests, as mentioned by Silvia, are also not recognized by public. Bioeconomy trust depends on respecting and protecting natural ecosystems, on respecting the forests and trees, on alignment with the principles of circular economy and explaining all that clearly by science and media to public. As explained by Linda, the perceptions are many times not corresponding to reality. It is not easy to explain and understand the substitution effect, for example. Product information. For example, wood origin and health related information are important and should be included in sector, sector communication about products. Transparency, empowering consumers and building trust is essential. Product passport initiative, which is currently in development in European Commission, is an important opportunity worth seizing also in the context of wood related products. As mentioned by Christopher, an important question is also, is the fact that trees are universally loved, reaching also the political arena. One of the lessons learned from COVID crisis and one that could be already learned also from climate and biodiversity crisis is that in search for sustainability, policy making in the future will need to be more science based. This would not only raise the responsibility level of policies, 
the fact that scientists are more trusted by public than politicians could also improve the trust in policy making. But we have heard also that cohesion and coherence of science is also important and should improve. Scientists are too often unclear what they talk about and the trust scientists possess increase also their responsibility, which was so well and clearly explained by Joran. International science policy interfaces like IPPC, IPBS and IRP are creating a critical level of science and an important contribution in this respect. From my experience, it's based on the work with IRP, I would just add that it's not automatic that those possessing the knowledge are also best equipped for sharing it with media and public, but also with policymakers, which by the way, we didn't talk a lot about that. This needs a lot of careful crafting, work and understanding. Simple, useful, understandable communication is far from easy. It is not easy to move from the scientific comfort zone to the zone of charming arrogance, as you have heard. Important skills are needed, but it is essential. So, dear friends, today's webinar has not solved all the challenges we face in this respect, but it has clearly contributed to better understanding them. I hope you have enjoyed it and that you will join also next time when we will be discussing forest, forestry, bioeconomy related issues. Stay trustable friends of European Forest Institute and Think Forest. Thank you for your attention. Stay safe. And again, back to Virpi. Thank you so much, Janic, for your concluding remarks. Thank you all. Thank you all the participants for your very active participation, uh, for the excellent, excellent speakers for your great talks and discussions. Now it's time to say goodbye. So take care, keep safe, and we'll meet again, and hopefully soon in person. Have a nice day.